Good evening. I'm Martha Minow, and I'd like to say it again. Good evening. Good evening. Fabulous. Thank you. Uh, it is a thrill to be here uh, with you all, uh, even though one of the reasons is a sad one, as we remember David Grossman with love and honor. I do want, before we actually start the program, to ask if you have an empty seat near you, would you raise your hand? And so people who are standing in the back can see the people with raised hands, there are empty seats and there are three in the front row as well. If anyone who's standing would like a seat, keep them high. Thank you very much. This is the David A. Grossman Memorial Lecture with Stacy Grossman, Project No One Leaves, and the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau. We are delighted here at Harvard Law School to welcome you all and to welcome Matthew Desmond, who will be giving a talk entitled Eviction, Displacement, and the Fight to Keep Communities Together. Before I introduce Professor Desmond, I want to take a moment to reflect on the extraordinary life and legacy of the wonderful teacher, lawyer, colleague, and my dear friend David Grossman. David devoted his life to pursuing justice with creativity, with integrity, and with craft. And he inspired and enabled students across generations to do so as well. As a clinical professor here, he played pivotal roles in the Wilmer Hale Legal Services Center and then as managing attorney, faculty director of the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau. <laughs> Among other efforts, as so many of you here know, he guided the project No One Leaves, which is a nonprofit tenants' rights effort, and it is nationally recognized, and it is changing lives. He made sure that lawyers and law students worked hand in hand with clients, community members, community organizations. He made legal education and organizing as central as the articulation and enforcement of rights, because they are as central. And he focused the work on strengthening tools and spirit, both necessary for helping people in need for changing laws and enforcing laws and changing the politics around those laws. With formidable intellect, constant courage, David brought tremendous humility, humor, friendship, outstanding sunglasses <laughs> to every encounter, and he elevated allies and opponents alike he modeled what it is to engage in the world with respect for every person, even if you disagree with them. We were truly honored and blessed to have his extraordinary work, his inspiring leadership, and his friendship. I am so delighted that we have Matt Desmond here today, who is a champion for the goals and the values and the humanity exemplified by David Grossman and advanced by him every day. Let me tell you about Matthew Desmond. He's an award-winning author. Early in March, he published the electrifying and powerful book, Evicted, Poverty and Profit in the American City. How many people have read it? Excellent. If you haven't, time to read it. He is the John L. Loeb Associate Professor of the Social Sciences at Harvard University and co-director of the Justice and Poverty Project. He's a former member of the Harvard Society of Fellows. I'm a senior fellow. I can tell you I could never be elected a fellow. You have to be extraordinary, and he is. Uh, he wrote the award-winning book On the Fire Line, and he was co-author of two books on race, editor of a collection of studies on severe deprivation in America. His work has been supported by foundations, including the Ford Foundation, the Russell Sage Foundation, the National Science Foundation. And his writing has appeared across the country. There's a seat. Anyone have a seat, seat near you? Anybody? Here's one. Uh, and his writing has appeared in the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Chicago Tribune. In 2015, he was awarded a MacArthur Fellowship, which is sometimes known as the Genius Award. 
Following his talk, which I think will take about 30 minutes, we will move into a panel discussion. We're honored today to have Lisa Owens, Carrie Chance, Adam Meyer, and it'll be moderated by Eloise Lawrence, who will give you more background about our great panelists. Eloise, let me tell you, for those who don't know, is our amazing clinical instructor in community lawyering, lecturer here in law. She served as a staff attorney at the Bureau for over three years. She's deeply involved in exactly this work, post-foreclosure evictions, and has worked closely uh, with all the community partners in Project No One Leaves. Immediately following this event, we'll have a reception in the lobby, and I invite you to get your book signed, if you have one already or you want to get a new one, and also check out the very powerful photo exhibit by public health specialist, friend and collaborator of David, Ethan Maskoop. The photos depict the bad housing conditions that people live in every day. Please join me in welcoming Matthew Desmond. Thank you, Dean Minow, so much. And um, thank you so much for this invitation. Thank you all for coming out on this kind of cold and nasty day. I know you didn't come out for me. I know you came out because you love Dan and he touched your life in some way and inspired you, whether it was in your community, synagogue, in your relationships, in your communities, out in Dorchester, Roxbury, here at Harvard. And he certainly did that in my life too. This is, um, this is like the greatest honor of my career to give a lecture in Dave's memory. And uh, I feel the weight of that and the honor of that. It's the second time that I've given a talk in memory of Dave. Uh, the first time was uh, last semester. I teach a class on poverty in America in the uh, Faculty of Arts and Sciences, and I dedicated that class to Dave this semester because Dave uh, taught us, taught me, uh, that understanding these super complex problems, these pressing problems of our day, requires a lot of us. It requires lawyers and academics, requires folks working out in the communities, and we need to all work together and gather around this table to confront these great issues of poverty and the lack of affordable housing, mass incarceration, lack of justice in some of our communities. Dave taught me that, and I tried to emulate that in our class. So students were introduced not only to cutting edge research, but they were introduced to folks trying to work, make ends meet working minimum wage. They were introduced to folks facing uh, eviction. Uh, they were introduced to folks right out of prison, and we asked them questions and engaged with them, and I think that's very much in the spirit and legacy of Dave. And uh, so, Thank you so much for this amazing honor, and, um, and thank you, Dave, for this amazing life. Um, so America is unmatched by any rich democracy for the depth and expanse of its poverty. We're the worst, and that fact has always troubled me and bothered me. I've always thought that was wholly unnecessary, and I wanted to understand the role that housing plays in deepening poverty in our cities, and I thought eviction uh, was a very good kind of glimpse into that. So I started this project the old fashioned way. I moved into a trailer park on the south side of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I rented a trailer there and I lived there for about five months. And then I moved to the north side of the city and I rented a room in a rooming house in the inner city and I lived there for about 10 months. And from those two neighborhoods, I met families going through an eviction and tried to follow them wherever they went. I went to eviction court with them, followed them into abandoned shelters, houses, I watched their kids, I ate from their tables, slept on their uh, beds, and um, went to funerals with them, was even there for a birth. And try to just generally try to understand their lives as deeply and completely as possible. I went to Texas with family and with, uh, to Iowa with another. But at the same time, I knew to really understand this thing, to understand the role that housing is playing and spreading inequality today, I needed to understand landlord's perspectives too. So if you were getting evicted, I wanted to get just as deep with your landlord doing the evicted as I did with you, and I did. So I followed landlords to eviction court too, and I saw them pass out eviction notices and collect the rents. I kind of understood what makes them tick and why they would buy properties in some of our worst neighborhoods. And when I was spending more and more time with tenants and landlords, I found myself needing answers to basic questions that were beyond the reach of my field work, like how often does eviction happen? Who's it happen to? What are the long-term consequences of eviction? And I went looking for data and studies that kind of addressed these questions and just kind of came up empty. 
you know, we in the poverty research world had focused a lot on public housing, and we'd focused a lot on neighborhoods. But the private housing market, this place where the vast majority of poor families live, this place that I was watching consume most of folks' income, dictating where they lived and who they lived with, we didn't know a lot about it. We certainly didn't know a lot about eviction. So I did a few things to kind of collect larger data on this issue. We started with a survey of tenants in Milwaukee, and we ended up uh, interviewing about 1,000 tenants all over Milwaukee in great neighborhoods, the blue dots, and more troubled neighborhoods. Those are the red dots. And we sent interviewers into families' homes to ask them 250 questions about their life and their kids and their housing and their moves. Um, one interviewer was bit by a dog, and another one was mugged. It was actually the same interviewer. <laughs> <laughs> Needs to work on a situational awareness. <laughs> but we worked hard for this data, and we, we got it. We got an 84% response rate, which reflects a really high quality level of data. And we're learning a lot of new things from it about the role that housing is playing in the story of poverty today in this country. Didn't stop there. Ended up analyzing hundreds of thousands of eviction records from Milwaukee and other cities, millions of 911 calls. We talked to 250 people in eviction court right after their eviction court hearing. We analyzed hundreds of nuisance ordinances that were placed on properties. And we generally tried to take that statistical data and put it in conversation with the ethnographic data. And each of those methods kind of worked off each other, challenged each other, and I think each kept the other honest. But Evicted is a book that starts on the ground and ends uh, on the ground. And it follows eight families. Some are black, some are white, some have kids, some don't. Uh, swept up in the process of eviction. So we meet people in the book like uh, Lorraine, who is uh, my neighbor at the trailer park. She was a grandmother spending over 70% of her income on rent, who had to decide between paying the rent and keeping her heat on. We meet Lamar, who is this gregarious, amazing single dad who's trying to raise two adolescent boys in the, in the inner city. And he was wheelchair bound, and he tried to work off the rent uh, with his landlord when he fell behind, and it didn't work out for him. We meet Veneta, who was this single mom of three young kids who, while they were homeless, uh, kind of organized the Easter egg hunt in the homeless shelter to bring light and um, joy in this really tough time. This was someone that didn't have any criminal record, but when her hours got cut at Old Country Buffet, um, committed armed robbery to try to keep her kids in the home. I don't have time to tell you about all these incredibly complicated and uh, full people uh, today, but I do want to share one story with you. Uh, it's our lean story. So it had been a difficult year ever since uh, that snowball. Our lean's 14-year-old son, Jory, and his cousin were cutting up. They were throwing snowballs at passing cars, like 14-year-olds do. And uh, Jory like, packed this tight one and smacked this car, and it jerked to the stop, and this man jumped out. And Jory and his cousin ran inside and locked the door, and the man kicked it in. And he left, thank God, before anything else happened. Uh, but when Arlene's landlord found out about that, she decided to evict Arlene and her children. And Arlene cussed Jory because uh, she couldn't cuss the landlord. So Arlene took her two boys, Jory was 14 at the time, Jafaris was six, to a Salvation Army homeless shelter, which everyone in Milwaukee just calls the lodge. So you can tell your kids, like, we're staying at the lodge tonight like it's a hotel. And from there, the family was on the hunt for another place to live. And they found a place on 19th Street. There often was no water, and Jory had to bucket out what was in the toilet. It was quiet, Arlene remembered, and 525 for a whole house. It was my favorite place. We know from the survey data that families that get evicted relocate to much worse housing than they lived in before. If we want to know why some low-income families live in substandard housing conditions, which is absolutely terrible for children's health, one answer is that they're forced to in the harried aftermath of an eviction. So the city eventually found Arlene's favorite place. This is it, unfit for human habitation. And uh, they boarded up the windows and the doors, and the family was once again on the hunt for another place to live. Arlene told Jory, we take whatever we can get. And that's what housing and neighborhood selection looks like at the very bottom, just taking whatever you can get. And what Arlene could get at that time was a drab apartment complex on Atkinson Avenue. But she soon learned that it was a haven for drug dealers. In fact, the whole drug was, uh, the whole block was drug soaked, it's hot. And she was terrified for her boys, especially for Jory, who was goofy and had this beautiful smile and would talk to anyone. So for Arlene, why she moved, the fact that she was evicted, was consequential in, in understanding why she ended up in such a distressed neighborhood. 
That's a relationship that you can test with, with statistical data too, and we did. And we found that evicted families move, all else equal, from poor neighborhoods to even poorer neighborhoods, neighborhoods with a lot of crime to neighborhoods with even more crime. Arlene moved out as fast as she could. She found a two-bedroom apartment on 13th Street. There was this like whole big hole in the window. The carpet was filthy and grounded to the floor. The door had to be locked with this like like a plank you slid into brackets. But Arlene put on a good face. She uh, stuffed a piece of cloth into the hole and she hung ivory curtains. The rent for that kind of place, which was located in a very poor neighborhood in America's fourth poorest city, was $550 a month, utilities not included. That rent took 88% of Arlene's welfare check. She knew that some months she'd have to sell her food stamps to make rent. The refrigerator and the pantry would be empty and the, uh, the boys in her would try to get by on oodles and noodles. There'd be no extra money for anything. No clothes, no new books for jewelry, no toys for Jafaris. So Jafaris had this amazing ability to take like a leash or a broken mop handle or screwdriver or whatever and transform them into like soldiers locked in battle. As this room well knows, Arlene is not alone in spending the vast majority of her income on housing. For the past hundred years, there's been a consensus in this country that Americans should spend about 30% of our income on housing. That gives us enough money to save to feed our family for transportation. And for a long time, most renters met that goal. Uh, but times have changed. To the point that today, most poor renting families in America spend at least half of their income on housing, and at least one in four are spending 70% of their income or more just on rent and utilities. Just think about that. 70% of your income, poof, gone at the first of the month if you want a roof over your head and heat. Under those conditions, you don't need a major event to invite eviction. Something as innocent as a snowball can do it. For people like Arlene, eviction is much more the result of inevitability than personal irresponsibility. What's happened? Well, in the 2000s, median rent everywhere in the United States shot up by amazing rates, especially here in the Northeast, increased by about 40% between 2000 and 2010. Between 1995 and today, median rent in this country has increased over 70%. Utilities have increased too. But during the years where low-income families were seeing their housing costs soar, their incomes were stagnant. Sometimes they were even falling. So there's been this widening gap between what poor families were taking in and what they were required to pay for basic shelter. And during the years where more and more families were in need, and were in need of help for their housing, fewer and fewer were receiving it. I think that most Americans still believe or still assume that the typical low-income family lives in public housing or in some other way benefits from housing assistance. But the opposite is true. Today, only about one in four Americans that qualify for housing assistance receive anything, which is a situation that I think would be unthinkable with other kinds of basic necessities. Imagine if we turned away three in four families that applied for food stamps. I'm sorry, you're just going to have to go hungry. But that's exactly how we treat most poor families seeking shelter. Arlene gave up looking for uh, housing assistance a long time ago, but one day on a whim, she stopped by the housing authority and asked about the list. And she was told by, by the woman behind the glass that the list is frozen, because on it were 3,500 families that had applied for rent assistance four years ago. That could be a lot worse. I mean, in some of our biggest cities, the wait list for public housing is not counted in years, it's counted in decades. So a young parent who applied for public housing in Washington, D.C. is probably a grandparent by the time her application comes up for review. So if Arlene wanted public housing, this is what she'd have to do. She'd have to wait about three or four years until the list unfroze. Then she'd have to wait about five years until her application made it to the top of the pile. And then she would just have to like pray that the person reviewing her application would ignore all the evictions she'd collected while trying to make ends meet unassisted uh, on a welfare check. On 13th Street, Arlene found rollers and brushes and a five-gallon bucket of paint in the basement, and she gave the walls a fresh coat. But soon after she moved in, her sister died. It wasn't her biological sister, it was like her spiritual sister. You know, they were close. And she contributed some money to the funeral. Uh, she didn't have it, but no one else did either. And she thought it was her obligation to pitch in. The next month, she missed an appointment with her welfare caseworker because the letter announcing the appointment was mailed to 19th Street, 
or maybe Atkinson Avenue. So two months behind, Arlene got the pink papers, the eviction summons and complaint. So Milwaukee is a city of about 105,000 renter households. Every year in that city, landlords evict roughly 16,000 people um, all, all year round. That's 40 people evicted every day. If you look only in the inner city of Milwaukee, you learn that one in 14 renters is evicted every single year. Eviction has become, frankly, commonplace in our poorest neighborhoods. Milwaukee's no outlier. The numbers are similar in Kansas City, in Cleveland, in Chicago, Boston. New York City sees 60 martial evictions every single day. How are you guys doing? No, it's great. Come on in. Yeah, it's so great. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Oh, City Life. I love you guys. Thank you so much. If you look at the national data, you learn that about renters, renters in about 2.8 million homes think that they're going to be evicted soon. So these numbers, to me, are startling and scary. We should have got a bigger room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a few seats right here. There's a, there's a, there's actually a lot of seats right here. Actually, people have generously given up their seats. That's perfect. There's like, there's, like, there's like nine seats here, 10 seats here. Come on down, come on yeah. down. Please forgive the interruption. No, no. I'm Matt. Uh, so nice to meet you. So this is a conversation about how often eviction is taking place. And the answer to that question is very often. And it's not just in Milwaukee, and it's not just in Boston. It's in cities in the south and in the north and in the middle of the country. These numbers reflect only formal court-ordered evictions. These are evictions that go through the court. But there are other ways, cheaper and quicker ways, for a landlord to displace a tenant. So Joe Perzinski, landlord in the inner city of Milwaukee, he would do this thing where if you were behind, he would just say, look, if you're out by Sunday, I'll pay you $200 and you can use my van to move. If you're going to get evicted, you want that eviction. I met another landlord that if you fall behind, he'll just take your door off. We worked really hard in the survey data to get a hold of those informal evictions, all those evictions that we don't see go through the court. And if you count those evictions and you add those with formal evictions that do go through the court, there's totally seats down here. It's like prime real estate down here. <laughs> I'm going to start renting these seats out. <laughs> you guys good? You want to do it? We good? OK. So if you count informal evictions that never see the inside of a court, if you count formal evictions that do, if you add up landlord foreclosures and building condemnations when the city finds your building unfit for human habitation, you add all those up, you learn that about every, in every two years, one in eight renters in the city of Milwaukee is evicted. One in eight. It's an incredible amount of instability. It's an incredible amount of frequency. And most of those evictions, yes, do it. You deserve it. <laughs> most of these evictions are informal evictions. Most of these evictions do not see the inside of a court. So eviction affects the young and the old. It affects the sick and the able body. But the face of America's eviction epidemic is moms with kids. It's moms with kids. And if you go into basically any urban housing court in the country, you can see this for yourself. Until very recently, the housing court in the South Bronx had a daycare because there were so many kids coming through its doors. Most households evicted in Milwaukee have children living in them. And poor African-American mothers and women more generally are evicted at stunningly high rates. Among renters in Milwaukee, one in five black women report being evicted sometime in their life versus one in 15 white women. The way I've come to think about eviction, it's like the feminine equivalent to incarceration. 
There's so many of our young, poor black men getting locked up. For poor black women, they're getting locked out. But the lack of affordable housing in our cities and the growing number of Americans paying 50, 60, 70 percent of our incomes on housing, that's something that's affecting a lot of communities, white and black families, immigrant communities too. Today, one in five of all renting households in America spends at least half of its income on housing. This is something that's not concentrated in a particular region of the country or a particular community. This is affecting a lot of different folks. So in eviction court, as in court custom, as is court custom, Arlene got two extra days to stay in her apartment for each of her two dependent children. And those days came and went. And she had to be out uh, by a day in early January. Milwaukee's cold. And this winter was especially cold. The weathermen had been working themselves up. Uh, they said that it could be negative 40 with the wind chill. And there was like this frostbite warning they kept flashing across the screen. But if Arlene waited any longer, her landlord would call the sheriff, who days later would show up with um, a sidearm and a folded judge's order and a team of movers. And they would have piled everything on the sidewalk, her mattresses, the meat cuts in the freezer, Jafar's asthma machine. So they left. And Jory loaded this U-Haul moving truck that a family friend had rented for them. And it was just freezing, and the cold gripped him. But he smiled through it. He was happy to be helping his family. Arlene didn't know where her boys uh, would stay that night, sleep that night. She um, had tried the lodge and other shelters, but they were full as usual. She'd have to worry about that later. For now, she was focused on taking what she could to a storage unit that she had sold half of her food stamps and a space heater to rent. So Arlene finally found a room in a shelter 30 minutes away from Milwaukee. And again, she was on the hunt for another place to live. And she called on or applied for 20 apartments and then 40, and then 60, and then 80, I counted. She had been accepted to none. Even in the inner city, many were out of reach. And the landlords of the places she could afford, if she threw basically whatever she had at rent, weren't calling back either. And part of the reason, besides her poverty, uh, was her eviction notice. So in Milwaukee, your eviction is free and published online for all to see. It's the, it's the case in a lot of our cities across America, thanks to open record laws. And landlords can see your judgment for eviction and how much it's claimed that you are owed through that eviction process. And as this room knows, landlords reject, often reject folks with recent eviction records. And that's the mechanism that explains why families after their eviction are pushed into worse housing and into worse neighborhoods. So finally, the 90th landlord Arlene approached said yes, Mr. 90. He had a one-bedroom apartment for 525. Arlene didn't much consider the place or the conditions of the neighborhood. We take whatever we can get. A house is a house, she told Jory. So two months after her eviction court hearing, they moved in. And uh, they moved all the bags up and the boxes up. And after everything was kind of moved in, Arlene just like sat on the floor. And she leaned against this trash bag full of towels. And she just like breathed out. And Jory came and sat next to his mom and pitched his head into her shoulder. And Jafaris came and laid his uh, six-year-old head on her lap. And they just like stayed like that for a long time. So Arlene uh, got her stuff out of storage. She hung pictures on the wall. She liked things neat. So she wrote a little note to Jory over the sink that said, if you don't clean up after yourself, we're going to have problems. <laughs> so uh, Jory went to a new school. Jory went to a lot of new schools. Between seventh and eighth grade, Jory went to five different schools. It's hard to be 14. And it's hard to be 14 to experience long stretches of homelessness. He started acting out in his new school. And uh, one day, a teacher yelled at him. And he kicked her in the shin and ran home. And when he did that, the teacher didn't call the principal. She called the police. And after officers paid Arlene a visit, her landlord told her she had to go. It's kids. Kids. They can prolong the time you're homeless after your eviction, and they sometimes are the reason for your eviction. In fact, when we analyzed the data from 250 people we talked to in eviction court, and we wanted to know what explains why you get evicted and you don't, even though you owe your landlord the exact same amount of money, the big finding we found is kids. If you have kids, the odds of you receiving an eviction judgment triple. 
And what you're seeing in that finding is landlord discretion. You're seeing some landlords decide to work with smaller families or tenants without kids versus working with those that are bigger families or tenants with kids. So after that eviction, Arlene kind of started to unravel. It's like I got a curse on me, she told me. It won't stop for nothing. Sometimes I find my body trembling or shaking. I'm tired, but I can't sleep. I'm fixing to have a nervous breakdown. My body is trying to shut down. I recently published a study that found that mothers, two years after their eviction, still experience higher rates of depression. And we know that between 2005 and 2010, suicides attributed to evictions doubled. And those were years where housing costs in many of our cities were going up and up and up. Just my soul is messed up, Arlene told me. I wish my life were different. I wish that when I be an old lady, I can sit back and look at my kids and they be grown and they, you know, become something. And we'll all be together and be laughing. We'll be remembering stuff like this and be laughing at it. The home is the center of life. It's the wellspring of personhood. It's our refuge from work, the menace of the streets. We say that at home, we're ourselves. Everywhere else, we're someone else. At home, we remove our masks. It's at home where we as children, we play. And as adolescents, we retreat and try. As we grow older, we try to settle down somewhere, raise a family, invest in our work. In languages spoken all over the world, the word for home encompasses not just shelter, but warmth, family, the womb. Eviction causes loss. Families not only lose their homes, they often lose their schools, communities, their possessions too, which are taken by movers or piled on the sidewalk. It takes a lot of time and money to build a home. Eviction can erase all that. Eviction can bar you not only from decent housing in a safe neighborhood, but it can also prevent you from receiving government help because public housing authorities treat eviction as a mark against your record, which means we're systematically denying help to families that most need it. Evicted families, evicted, eviction can cause workers to lose their jobs. And those of you in this room that have gone through this process know exactly why. It's such a consuming, stressful, drawn out event. It can cause you to make mistakes at work and eventually lose your footing in the labor market. And then there's the toll eviction takes on your spirit, your mental health. And if you add all that up, I think we have to conclude that eviction, which used to be rare in this country, which used to draw crowds in our cities, is not just a condition of poverty, it's a cause of it. It's making things worse. We can't fix poverty in America if we don't fix housing. So how do we fix it? Imagine if every family in America had a decent and affordable place to live. If Arlene didn't have to dedicate 88% of her income to rent, she could keep her kids fed and clothed and off the street. Research tells us that when families finally receive a housing voucher, which allows them to pay 30% of their income to rent, when they finally receive a housing voucher after years and years on the waiting list, they do one really consistent thing with their freed up income. They take it to the grocery store. They buy more food. Their kids become stronger and less anemic. Housing vouchers are a blessing for those who hold them, but the majority of poor families aren't so lucky, and their kids with names like Jory and Jafaris aren't getting enough to eat because the rent eats first. If we can't enjoy the freedoms that America offers without a roof over your head, the freedom to better yourself, to better your children, to invest in your communities, then shouldn't the right to housing be part of what it means to be an American? We've affirmed provision in old age, 12 years of education and basic nutrition to be the right of every citizen because we've recognized that human dignity and economic mobility depend on the fulfillment of those basic human needs. And it's impossible to argue that housing is not a basic human need. I think housing absolutely should be a right to everyone in this country. And the reason is very simple. Without stable shelter, everything else falls apart. So how can we deliver on that obligation? I think there's good news here. The good news is we made impressive strides over the generations 
with respect to housing. Just a few generations ago, slums were teeming in our cities. There are outhouses in the middle of Philadelphia. Poor folks were living without heat and running water. We took on a battle with the slum, and we won. We won. And I'll be the first to tell you that we still have a long way to go. When I lived in the trailer, most of the time I didn't have hot water, and I told the landlord, I'm a writer, I'm going to write about you in your trailer park. <laughs> so imagine what my neighbors have to deal with. But there's no arguing that we've made amazing progress over the generations when it comes to housing quality in our cities. And I'm also heartened by the fact that there are organizations working hard all around this country to prevent family homelessness, to drive down evictions, and to preserve affordable housing. And one thing that we've done with the proceeds from this book is start an organization called Just Shelter that amplifies and shows people that work. So if you live in Boston or in Connecticut or California or Alaska, you can go to this website, justshelter.org, and you can click on your state as you can see organizations like City Life and get connected with your time and your resources if you want to do that. The fight for affordable housing is often block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood, and this shows like over 600 nonprofit and community organizations that are hard at work on this. So thank you all of you that are involved in that work. So a problem as big as the affordable housing crisis calls for a big solution. And I think the solution should be a universal housing voucher program. The idea is simple. We already have a housing voucher program. It works pretty darn well. It just doesn't reach most poor families. So instead of paying 88%, 70%, 60% of your income on housing, if you had a voucher, you could take that voucher and live anywhere you wanted, as long as your housing wasn't too expensive or too shoddy, and you pay 30% of your income on housing with the voucher covering the rest. That would fundamentally change the face of poverty in America. It would drive down evictions. It would drive down family homelessness. Families would immediately feel the income gains and be able to invest in themselves through job training or schooling, start modest savings account. They would find stability and have a sense of ownership over their home or their communities. Would it be a disincentive to work? That's a question that I get a lot. There's a study that shows that housing vouchers do result in a modest reduction of work hours. There's a lot of other studies that show no results. And I think, in truth, the status quo is much bigger threat to self-sufficiency than any affordable housing program could be. Families crushed by the high cost of housing can't afford vocational training or extra schooling that would allow them to acquire new skills. Many can't stay in one place long enough to hold down a job. And just think of all like the energy and the talent and the brain power that's squandered by the fact that mothers and fathers have to spend so much of their time and, and thoughts kind of trying to prevent eviction or, after they're evicted, trying to find another place to live. The poor don't want some small life. They want to thrive and contribute. They want to become nurses and drive buses. They want to have their own ministries. That was Arlene's goal. And a stable home would extend them the opportunity to realize those dreams. Poverty reduces people born for better things. And I think that a universal housing program would be an anti-poverty effort, a human capital investment, a community improvement plan, and a public health initiative all rolled into one. Can we afford it? Some economists have argued that if we take the housing voucher program that we have and make it more efficient, we can extend it to all families below the poverty line without much additional spending. If we did nothing to make the program more efficient, it would probably cost us an additional $22 billion a year. That's not a small figure, but it's also one that's well within our capacity. We have the money. We've just made choices about how to spend it. So today, housing-related tax expenditures, like the mortgage income tax deduction, far outpace those for housing assistance to poor renters. We have a universal housing program in this country. It's just not for low-income families. <laughs> the year Arlene was evicted from 13th Street, federal expenditures for direct housing assistance totaled $41 billion. That same year, homeowner tax benefits exceeded $171 billion. That number, $171 billion, that was equivalent to that year's budgets for the Department of Education, Veteran Affairs, Homeland Security, Justice, and Agriculture combined. It's a rather large number. Most federal housing subsidies benefit families with six-figure incomes. 
we're going to spend the bulk of our public dollars on the affluent, at least when it comes to housing. Let's just be honest about that. Let's just own up to that. And stop repeating the canard, this wealthy nation can't afford to do more. If poverty persists in America, it's not for lack of resources. We lack something else. So this is just one idea, a universal housing voucher program. Let others come. What works in Boston fails in Milwaukee. What LA needs, Houston doesn't. One city has to build, another has to destroy. Our cities are rich in diversity, their problems and their gifts, and maybe our public policy should be too. But I think one thing is certain, this degree of inequality, this cold denial of basic rights, this blunting of human capacity, this level of social suffering, this isn't us. This doesn't have to be us. By no American value is this situation justified. There is no ethical code or holy teaching or scripture that can be summoned to allow us to defend what our country has become. Thanks. Matt, for coming today to honor Dave Grossman and to share your work that is changing the national conversation about a problem that has long existed in the shadows. Every time I open a newspaper or turn on the radio these days, I feel like I hear your voice and I wonder how you're keeping up the pace. But I am so glad. I am so glad that this conversation is finally happening. While it is a problem that many in this audience have experienced firsthand as tenants, or as former owners in foreclosed properties, or observed and borne witness to as legal services attorneys or social workers, the general public and the media have not, until recently, focused on this critical issue of eviction and displacement that your book so aptly exposes as a cause of poverty, not just as a result. As Dean Minow said, my name is Eloise Lawrence, and I'm a clinical instructor at uh, the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau, and I had the tremendous honor of working with David Grossman. It was actually for Dave, but he would never have agreed to that <laughs> pronoun, so I'll say with. But in particular, Dave and I worked together with many in this room on the project No One Leaves, which was a response to the foreclosure crisis, a response that employed what we call the sword and shield model. The sword is collective action, and the shield is the legal defense um, in eviction court, mostly, that we use to keep people in their homes and stabilize communities. I'm sure Adam Myers, who's on the end, who was a student leader in the effort, and Lisa Owens, the director of City Life Vita Urbana, the sword side of the equation, will also discuss the model and the project. But Dave was, Dave was a man of action and advocacy, and he would not have wanted us to waste this moment of awareness created in no small part by Matt's book about displacement and eviction, the problem that Dave spent most of his career working to combat. He would not wanted us to waste this precious moment. No, he would have wanted us to ask the question, what are we doing to use this moment to change the reality on the ground for low-income families and communities? And this is why we today, at Project No One Leaves, and the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau have asked these three wonderful people to come and talk to us today about the work that they are doing in their communities um, and what they have witnessed, which is similar and different from uh, what Matt described in Milwaukee, but is equally important. Because as Matt said, the solutions that may work in Milwaukee and San Francisco and Boston may be different, but we need to try them all. So first, let me introduce, um, I want to introduce Lisa Owens, who uh, may have been a little late tonight, but is once again, it's an, it's an example of the spirit of city life. Because I gather that the reason that they were a little delayed was because they had a bus coming from J Jamaica Plain, mm -hmm. and there were a few members who were a little late. <coughs> and so the bus had left, but it came back. 
because in Project No One Leaves, no one gets left. And Lisa is the, uh, is, the, is the leader, fearless leader, of this incredible organization. She's had a lifetime of working for social and racial justice and is a, long, a, a lifelong Bostonian. Pretty close, pretty close. Um, so speaks from this both professionally and personally, and I think is gonna, be, is gonna tell you a lot about uh, what's happening here in Boston. We also are very lucky to have Carrie Chance. Carrie is um, also is an academic, but is also an activist and has worked in uh, South Africa and in Chicago on the anti-eviction campaign and is an, a very noted scholar, which I'll let you read about in the, in the program. But I want us to use our time quickly to get to some of the things that you all are observing. And Adam Myers is, uh, I was working for Adam too, um, when he was the student leader with uh, Dave Grossman uh, and was an incredible force here in Boston and has gone on to do wonderful things in Brooklyn where he is also fighting displacement as a legal services lawyer. And so this is a, a group of wonderful four people that are gonna talk to us and I'd like, I guess first maybe, uh, Adam, is it fair to pick on you? As, okay. okay. I, I, I'm going to ask the same question to everybody, so the, the ones at the end get the easier time of it. But um, I, I wanted to first uh, to ask you, Adam, what is displacement looking like in Brooklyn? Who is being affected? And um, how, how are people reacting to the displacement? Right. Um, so Brook, uh, displacement in Brooklyn looks like a lot of different things. Everything that Matthew described uh, exists in Brooklyn. Uh, there are people who have desperate problems with poverty. They face eviction on a very regular basis. They spend a lot of their time in housing court. Uh, when you go to Brooklyn Housing Court, which I thought Boston Housing Court was like a busy sort of calamitous place, Brooklyn Housing Court makes it look uh, very orderly and, <laughs> and small. There, are, You've got four different floors with a total of something like 15 courtrooms each of which have a daily docket of upwards of 50 or 60 cases daily of eviction cases that are being processed. By and large, these are cases that are brought by uh, landlords who have lawyers and tenants who do not have lawyers, and they are resolved with lopsided settlement agreements in the hallways of housing court that are sort of routinely stamped by the housing court judges there. Th there are a lot of problems with, with these poverty-related issues, people just can't afford the rent, they get displaced around. But then that has, that's layered on top uh, in Brooklyn of this, with this other issue, gentrification, where even folks who, they're, they're not desperately poor, they're lower middle income, maybe they're employed, maybe they're working multiple jobs, but since Brooklyn is one of the, you know, the centers of the universe right now, really a lot more people want to be there than can fit. This is driving up housing prices everywhere and it's creating enormous pressure on the private housing stock, encouraging landlords to do whatever they can to, to get these folks out. And so the, the reason that the ways in which this gentrification looks a little bit different from the sort of individual desperate poverty related situations is one, it's, it's about communities almost as much as individuals. Uh, the neighborhoods I work with, primarily Williamsburg, Greenpoint, Bushwick, these are communities that uh, you know, 40 years ago were populated largely with sort of recent immigrants. In uh, Williamsburg and Bushwick, you've got a lot of Puerto Rican and Dominican communities. In Greenpoint, you've got a lot of Polish communities. And these are folks who, when nobody else wanted to live here, when everyone else, when private capital had abandoned these neighborhoods, these folks moved in, they worked together, they you know, forced out the drug dealers, they repaired their own housing, sometimes they, they went through legal procedures to become cooperative owners of this housing, and they have, they have built these neighborhoods. And now that these neighborhoods are attractive, they are being pressured out by the rising rents. And so it's about communities in large part that we're trying to protect. Uh, and then in this situation with gentrification, conditions of disrepair uh, mean something different. In, in situations of desperate poverty, um, conditions of disrepair are about uh, you know, perhaps landlords not 
making enough income on this housing to do repairs or simply not caring enough. In Brooklyn, where Brooklyn tenants uh, are facing no heat, no hot water, uh, mold infestations, things like that, this is, this is deliberate because these tenants would otherwise be protected by rent regulation and the landlords in a lot of these cases want to do everything that they can to incentivize folks to leave their homes. These, these homes that they wouldn't otherwise, the landlords wouldn't be able to evict them from. And so uh, we see crazy situations where landlords, in, in, in the extreme situations, landlords will uh, affirmatively destroy their buildings so as to create conditions that are unlivable and force their landlords to leave. I represented a tenant association at a building in Greenpoint where one day in December 2013, someone came into the basement and destroyed the electric system, the gas system, the hot water heater, the boiler, and uh, the main water line with what was apparently an ax, uh, rendering the building uninhabitable and the tenants are still uh, fighting in the courts to get back in. It's a real problem. Um, what, are we, what are we doing about it? Uh, well, well, that's good. You want to stop there for now? Let's yeah. stop there, let's stop there. To. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Carrie, if you would describe a little bit what about what you've observed either in South, in South Africa and in Chicago, either. Sure. Well, first of all, I just want to say it's such an honor to, to be here. Um, so since 2005, I've conducted ethnographic and historical research in the South African cities of Cape Town, Durban, and Johannesburg in townships and track settlements there. And as I found, uh, the whole history, uh, whole South Africa, South Africa's modern history, from the first gesture of colonialism when Jan van Riebeck set foot in the Cape in 1652, could be told through successive evictions. The apartheid era, in, in the apartheid era, enforced racial segregation between 1948 and 1994 was achieved through housing resettlement when millions were forced to relocate. With the election of Nelson Mandela, housing became not only a right enshrined in the new South African constitution in 1997, but moreover a cornerstone of non-racial democratic citizenship, the material goods of a new social contract forged out of mass struggles. Yet evictions never abated in poor communities, and amid neoliberal reforms of the late 1990s and slum clearance initiatives in the 2000s, evictions began to intensify yet again. So the story of Monique, a domestic laborer in Cape Town, captures some of these lived transformations and with echoes here of the precarity felt in Milwaukee. In the mid-1990s, she and her seven-year-old daughter lived in a backyard shack made of wood planks and corrugated tin bereft of electricity or piped water. Seeking better conditions after her daughter developed a skin and bronchial condition, she rented a formal government subsidized home, an entirely common gray market rental in South Africa's informal housing economy. Until the real owners, under threat of legal action by the local council, arrived at 3 a.m. to evict her. Monique and her daughters then lived on the street in the back of a pickup truck. After evictions mounted in the mid-2000s, she and her neighbors illegally moved into unoccupied houses with official but fraudulent letters from a well-connected party official. The city government quickly sought to and secured their eviction through the courts. The now all too familiar scene of eviction broadcast on the national nightly news was violent. Without warning, police fired rubber bullets on crowds gathered in the streets trampling and shooting residents as they ran for cover. At least 20 people were injured and rushed to hospital, including a three-month-old child who was shot in the arm, leg, and foot. At, with nowhere else to go, Monique and about 1,000 others remained on the street, and under the banner of the, of the Poor People's Movement, known as the Anti-Eviction Campaign, began to build makeshift shacks out of a motley assortment of found materials. As they waited for their appeal, they staged a two-year-long land occupation and protest. As the story suggests, residents in South Africa and the United States are finding themselves at the tail end of very similar global processes. For instance, neoliberal policy reforms and aggressive cost recovery. Yet there are important differences that play out on national and local scales. Notably that South Africa 
in South Africa, the primary interlocutor, the agents evicting you, appearing in court, and yes, profiting, tends to be nested within the state, whereas in the US, it tends to be within the banks or corporations. So I hope in, as we go forward in talking about evictions in these multiple contexts, mm -hmm. we attend to these different scales and similarities mm -hmm. and differences. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Gary. Lisa. Sure. So I speak softly, so let me know if you can't hear me. Um, so I also want to just, um, just formally say thank you to HLAB and to Project No One Leaves, and, um, and, uh, and most especially thank you to Matthew Desmond for creating this, creating the space for this national conversation on eviction and displacement. Um, as you heard, um, my name is Lisa Owens, and I'm with City Life Theater Urbana. We are um, we we are a grass part of a larger national grassroots movement um, of affected tenants and homeowners and former homeowners fighting to 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 uh, to curb this 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 uh, epidemic of displacement that that we see um, affecting again tenants and homeowners and former homeowners throughout the greater Boston area. Um, and, you know, I think what I, what I wanted, so, so first I wanna say that, um, that I, find my, I found myself nodding my head a lot uh, as I hear about the Brooklyn uh, situation. Um, there are so many parallels between what, um, what we hear is happening in Brooklyn and what we see in Boston. Uh, so, so perhaps it's good to just give ourselves some context. Boston, you know, at, by this point, we have all heard or read the studies that talk about Boston being, you know, one of the most gentrifying cities in the country. We have we've heard or read about the studies that talk about Boston being um, one of the most um, income in uh, uh, um, unequitable places in terms of income inequality in the city in the country. Um, there are some in interesting statistics that talk about the, the, the gap between, you know, the, the top earners and the bottom earners, you know, something like 5%, the, the top 5% of income earners in Boston make 50, uh, over 15 times the bottom 20%. I mean, th this is the context that we find ourselves in in Boston. Stagnant wages, housing cost burden, um, you know, so this is, a, this is a city, Boston is a city of renters. Over 68% of Boston residents are renters uh, and, and overwhelmingly people of color, 70% of people of communities of color in Boston are, are um, either housing cost burden, paying more than 30% of their incomes on rent or, or severely housing cost burden, paying more than 50% of their income in rent. So we see so and, and so so there's that piece of the context, and then this is we we are experiencing um, a major development boom in Boston. Boston is a very attractive place to to live, and we see this resegregating of the city. Um, so so in addition, so first of all, Boston is a very difficult place to rent if you are if if you are. Um, in, if, you're, if you're a human being that's not in the, five per, the top 5%, first of all, um, and, th and then on top of that, this, this luxury development boom is just raising the, the, the rents for everybody, for everybody. And then, and, and also remember that we're still, there, there is still a foreclosure crisis. You know, we, we you know, unfortunately, the narrative in the media is that the housing foreclosure crisis is over, but we know that's not true. We know that communities of color in Boston overwhelmingly and disproportionately bore the brunt of, of um, this major transfer of wealth. So homeowners who, whose life savings were, uh, were, were literally sunk into their homes, all of that vanished, and so those people 
um, join the, 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 the large pool of renters in the city, right? And so there's more competition, um, but their income didn't, didn't rise, right? So there's, there's that. Um, and then right sort of at the, around 2011, 2012, we started to see uh, these, these corporate investors coming up and buying what typically would have been the housing stock for, for working class people. Um, and then and converting, flipping these, these properties um, into luxury developments or luxury rentals. So we've got, the, we've got corporate investors buying up the existing housing stock. We have new luxury development being constructed in the city of Boston. Um, and, and all of this contributes to the, the, the skyrocketing housing costs, right? Okay, so, so we're being squeezed from multiple angles. Okay, so what's happening? What's happening is that working class people who, uh, who otherwise would have been able to afford to rent in Boston are seeing, are seeing their rents being doubled and tripled and in some cases quadrupled to, to make way for, I mean really it's, 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 a, it's a cleansing of the city, right? There, there, there is, by either by by design or by or by happenstance, what's happening is at low income working class people are being pushed out, um, and and uh, and the, sort of all this housing stock. So I want to just give you a couple of examples of of who of of who is being affected by this context. Um, so we are so we are a tenant movement, tenant and homeowner, homeowner movement. We have weekly meetings where 120 people um, over two sites come uh, with their housing problems. Um, and so there's a, um, so I'll give you uh, two very quick stories. One story, uh, um, a woman who, uh, a woman and her child lived on the second floor of a triple decker in East Boston, one just, which is sort of ground zero for Boston in terms of displacement and gentrification. Um, living in bad conditions, um, uh, vermin, you know, um, living without heat or hot water in the winter, all of the things that we read in Matthew's book, paying her rent on time, on time, on time. Corporate investor comes, buys the building, in increases her rent by $300, and she can't pay, she can't pay. So she doesn't know what to do, she finds City Life, and, and she starts working with our legal team, and, and we'll talk to you about our, our Sword and the Shield strategy, starts working with our legal team and, and buys herself more time. And meanwhile, what she finds out is that everyone in, in her triple decker received the same rent increase. And so, and so these people start coming to, to City Life as well. Long story short, they get, they get to trial. Um, and so she's, doing, she's working with um, the wonderful students at HLab doing her pretrial um, motion. And her landlord gets scared. So this woman, who, who, pre, who if she hadn't been part of the movement, she would have left. Um, at the moment she got her rent increase, she would not have gone to court, and this is something that, that we read in Matthew's book as well, she, she would have been one of the ranks of people that, that wouldn't have had the opportunity to even exercise the rights that she has available to her. She's part of the movement, she learns how to fight, she gets, her landlord gets scared, and she, not only does she win through negotiation, a, 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 a rental, con um, a lease, which she didn't have before. She gets a lease, modest rent increases over the next couple of years, but her, her upstairs neighbor, who was, who was also going to, to trial a few months later, the landlord decides to settle with both of them at the same time, and that's the power of the movement. Um, so we, we have lots and lots of stories about how when we fight together, one person's case actually has this ripple effect. I know, we, we all want to say we win. Yeah, we all want to say we win. But there's this ripple effect, and, um, and so hopefully we can talk more about that. Lisa, thank you so much. There's so much in there. Um, You, um, one of the issues, obviously, that, that Matt highlights and that you have just discussed is the disproportionate effect that this is happening, 
having on people of color um, and how it plays out. I mean, I was very struck in, in Matt's book about the story of Ned and Pam and how that played out very differently than it did for Crystal and Renata. Do you, um, Matt, are you willing to talk a little bit about um, sort of how um, you came to understand how something like your solution would address that fundamental problem, that fundamental, the, the racial injustice that is so a part of our housing system and a part of our society and how a solution like yours would address what are, seems so deep, at least as the way you described it and in the work that Lisa and Adam and Carrie do. Um, yeah, so one, one thing that, um, that I learned was that if you look on the law, the books, uh, the law books in Milwaukee, and we look at the protections that renters are afforded, I think many of us would say, those are pretty good. Mm -hmm. You know, like you can withhold rent if your landlord has certain housing issues and, um, and uh, you don't even have to put an escrow, you can just straight keep it. Um, but you have to be in a position where you're not gonna ask your landlord for a favor, you know, because, um, because you're entering into an adversarial relationship with your landlord. Now, if you're someone like Arlene, it's paying 80% of your income to rent, you're gonna have to ask your landlord for a favor one of these months. And a lot of tenants move in behind from day one. So if your landlord asks you to pay first month, last month rent security, that's kind of impossible for someone like Arlene, so you're behind uh, on move-in day. Mm -hmm. And those rights afforded you kind of dissolve because they literally cost money. It's not legal for landlords to retaliate if you call a building inspector, but as you guys know, like you can evict someone at any time for non-payment of rent. And a lot of landlords are just more prone to if you do make that call. So I think that, especially for a context like this, where a lot of us care about the law and what the law can do to address these issues, one kind of answer is, you know, unless we fix that underlying problem of um, affordable housing, the lack of affordable housing, it's going to be really hard to allow folks to realize uh, and realize their rights. Yeah. yeah, Adam, I know in New York that they have, are increasing legal services dramatically. Uh, is that having an effect in, in ensuring that some of these rights, which are on paper, say in Milwaukee, are actually being enforced in New York? It's a good question. <laughs> uh, so uh, Eloise was referring to one component of the city of New York's sort of sweeping plan to try to address the, the, this disastrous problem of housing unaffordability in New York City. Um, among their other, the other components of this are, uh, are, are sort of systematic rezonings of different neighborhoods in New York City so as to allow more development of housing and then trying to, to sort of tack onto that private for-profit development a requirement that some of that housing be affordable to some people if you're gonna build. And so that's, that's what, what the base of the program is. And then in an attempt to sort of smooth things out with uh, housing advocates, one of the additional things that was thrown in was this big pot of funding for more lawyers to serve these areas that are gonna be rezoned so that these folks can defend their, their housing rights. Um, that is still being rolled out. Uh, folks are still being hired and the rezonings in these areas aren't even passed so it's gonna be interesting to see how the funding for lawyers and the timeline for the development that's gonna speed up the displacement line up. I don't think anybody knows the answer to that question. Um, as a general rule, having lawyers in Brooklyn Housing Court is an immense help. Um, lawyer can tell you what your rights are. A lawyer knows the process of housing court and if what you need is time to sort of get your finances in order or wait for your tax refund or whatever, a lawyer knows the process well enough to get you time in your housing court eviction case. Um, but funding for legal services doesn't fundamentally solve these problems where just the tenants don't have the necessary substantive rights. And so what, what I mean by that is that uh, in one of these areas that's being rezoned, that is, is part of the area I work in, uh, East New York, in this neighborhood on the east side of Brooklyn, that's gonna be rezoned, a lot of new housing is gonna be built up and so a lot of lawyers are sort of flooding in to try to make sure that folks don't get displaced. The problem is folks in those areas oftentimes live in housing that, as opposed to other areas of New York, housing that is unregulated. These are smaller buildings, often they're one or two family homes. A lot of folks live in illegal basement units. And these folks just don't have fundamental protections. Their landlords are still 
if they don't have a lease, their landlord is allowed to evict them, evict them for any reason or for no reason at all. And so a lawyer who's involved there can, can make sure that you got sort of the papers right and can make sure that we you know, get everything that we can out of this case, but they can't, they can't affect for you the right to stay there indefinitely if you don't otherwise have that right. And so that's a problem that, that this funding for legal services has not yet solved. Right, which goes back to, to Matt's suggestion of making it a, a, a right, which actually makes me think of, Carrie, when you mentioned that in South Africa after apartheid that housing is a, is a right in the South African Constitution. How have you seen that play out in reality? Yeah, it is a really important uh, difference between the U.S. context and the South African context, and I've seen this play out in anti-eviction campaign struggles, Cape Town versus Chicago. Um, I mean, it's part of, it's enshrined in section 26 of the Constitution, which ensures that, uh, that there's a progression real, progressive realization of housing rights. There's also a host of new legislation that it was taken up in the post-apartheid period to protect against arbitrary evictions. So the Prevention of Illegal Evictions Act, for instance, is often invoked. Uh, I mean, What's been, but what's been happening is that activists are newly able to use the formerly desegregated courts as a political terrain, um, as a political instrument. Um, so it tends, the activist movements that I work with, the anti-eviction campaign, Abathlale Basam Jandola, the South African Shack Builders Movement, tend to take three approaches. Uh, they say that we need to take an approach on one hand uh, on the streets, so deploying activists in a variety of ways that might include uh, mass actions, that might include eviction blockades, that might include um, mass meetings and events of that kind. Also, uh, the second ap approach is through the courts. So taking, uh, taking the state to court in a variety of ways, there might be civil trials, there's ex new experiments in tort law, uh, there's instances of taking landlords to court, um, trying again in similar ways to draw out the process of eviction. Uh, and then thirdly, you know, taking up the media as, uh, as a tactical uh, terrain. So in this instance, activists are you know, having press releases, uh, they're meeting with journalists, they're also developing their own media te techni technologies and techniques, so having websites, um, communicating with activists across the globe through internet-enabled cell phones and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lisa, that sounds a lot like, like city life. Do you want to describe sort of what city life does when, when we fail in court, which happens a lot? Um, what, what collective action and what does the, what does the sword do? Great. Um, so the, the sword and the shield model is, the, is the, the very skillful pairing of direct action organizing, public protest of all kinds, with um, some really creative uh, legal work from our, uh, with our legal partners at HLab and Greater Boston Legal Service Center <laughs> Services. Um, so, so all of this is in the is in the service of our long term vision, which is both um, defensive and offensive, you might say. So, so d defensively, we are fighting to stay in our homes, one home at a time, one building at a time, and we use we use a variety of methods from. From, um, from vigils and standouts in front of people's homes, you know, marches to, to, um, to, to management companies, to eviction blockades, to, uh, to, to media stories, to using, to demanding that our city officials, our, our elected and public officials stand on the side, stand with the tenants and with the former homeowners instead of with developers and, and, and other, um, uh, uh, entities that would profit off of our displacement, uh, so that so the sword really is that is a, a grass building a grassroots movement to take power so that we can defensively stay in our homes, um, and and that is only possible because we have uh, we we have such wonderful activist lawyers in uh, um, in GBLS and with HLab. Um, and Project No One Leaves as well. So together, we're able to defend our, defend our members, defend um, ourselves, and stay in our homes. And that's why we say when we fight, we win. It really is a collective movement. Uh, but, and it's important to say 
that these are defensive strategies. We're fighting so hard because we actually don't have community control over housing and land. And that's what we need, right? And so actually, so, so a, another defensive strategy is, is, to, um, is to use um, you know, um, um, kind of short term, shorter medium term campaigns like our right now, many of us in this room are connected with the, a Just Cause Eviction campaign um, to, to roll back uh, the, 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 um, the lack of protections that tenants have right now. So, so, um, but, so in Massachusetts, it's actually um, a landlord does not, have a, does not need to have a good reason to evict a tenant. Um, it's called no-fault eviction. Many of us are, know a lot about this. And, and the and corporate investors are using no-fault eviction as a way to flip buildings and do building clearouts, right? And so, so that is also an example of defensive sort of sword work. But it's very important also to remember that we are building power for community control over housing and land and connecting that with changing um, a governance structure so that so that uh, so that tenants and homeowners and former homeowners actually have real decision making power over what gets built in our neighborhood, what affordability metrics are used when we're talking about uh, developing and preserving affordable housing, and what re uh, how resources are are used to 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 build and preserve affordable housing, and 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 um, and making sure that that um, that the priorities of of the of people in the neighborhoods in the city working class low income people that our priorities are put first and so that those are some in, um, offensive strategies that we use and there are um, and there, there are both policy and and sort of practice. Um, uh, um, efforts that that we and many 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 other grassroots and, and community-based organizations are working on on that offensive side. Are, the, is the, are you seeing similar offensive work in New York? Or? Uh, we are. Yeah. I would say, I'd say nobody does it like City Life. Right? <laughs> and uh, and I want to emphasize that you know every everything that I've taken into my work in Brooklyn I got from City Life and from H Lab and from Dave Grossman in particular, uh, but. Yes, so as I was saying, and I guess my incomplete last answer, uh, a lawyer alone is not enough. These, these lawyers, where you've got to write, a lawyer will help you enforce it, and they can, they can eat up that time keeping you in your home, but it's not enough, and so that's where the rest of this comes in. And so, yeah, in New York City, the, among the tactics that my clients are using are, one, um, we use rent strikes, we use them a lot, uh, a lot of folks aren't big fans of this tool because it can be uh, risky. You've got you've to you've be good about it. You've got to make sure you're saving the rent. You've got to make sure that everyone's paying in because if at the end of the day you wind up short, you're going to have problems. But if you do it right, it can be a great tool. It can put an enormous amount of pressure on even, even a landlord who comes in and pays an astronomical amount of, this, of money for this apartment. If you stay in your home longer than he thinks you're going to, and if you cut off the flow of income to him, you know, there are, there are all sorts of ways that financing can fall apart with, with balloon payments on loans and whatnot. You can, you can really put pressure on the landlord, uh, which then you leverage into a settlement that lets people stay in their homes. Um, aside from rent strikes, we bring affirmative litigation against landlords to get repairs done, which in addition to improving the quality of housing and also that's another sort of pressure landlords uh, having to pay to make repairs landlords having to pay a lawyer to defend against this in housing court and that's all sort of in addition to this constant uh, effort at advocacy on these issues in uh, sort of the legislative realm and in the realm of public opinion uh, one of the nice things about New York is that nobody is immune from the rent problem. You know, everyone knows the rent is too damn high, whether you're paying $500 a month or $10,000 a month. You know, it's, it's putting pressure on everyone. And so, you know, you, you, a day does not go by when half a dozen media outlets aren't just looking for stories of people having trouble with their housing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, splashing your landlord's 
your, you know, your abusive landlord's name across the front page is another way of putting pressure, right. increasing your leverage. And, and just the, um, the fact that we all care about this, if we all get organized, if we all put pressure on our local elected officials, if we all put pressure on the mayor, uh, that's, that's how you sort of change these bigger, higher level policies toward creating the substantive rights that the lawyers couldn't otherwise create. That's great. I, I, um, you learned a lot here, I think. <laughs> it's impressive. Um, so I, I selfishly could ask them my questions all day long, uh, but I should probably be a little less selfish and allow some of you to ask questions of this amazing panel. Uh, so we have only a few minutes because I know there'll be people who would like to get some of the uh, treats outside and, and also some people would probably like to go home to their children and start signing books and all those kinds of things. So um, I, does anybody have a question? Just a couple of questions. And, and please, a question. Statements are good, but questions are better. <laughs> Hi, uh, my question is directed to uh, Mr. Adams Meyer. Uh, my name is Walt Cortez. Um, I have one of those landlords that are trying to destroy their building yeah. uh, to that extent here. Uh, my building, where I live, it used to be uh, affordable housing. They took over, so they still have some tenants. They still pay the very low rent agreement that they have with the city. So now what he's doing is letting ants being all over the place, uh, doesn't change the windows. So the older people, they get sick and one of them passed away last year. So we have this problem going on and I'm paying the normal rent of a luxury apartment, uh, almost $2,600. So I requested the ants to be eliminated back in uh, October of last year, and also to fix the, the windows and get over with this problem. They have been harassing, bringing the exterminator every week since then to put a gel in, and whatever I saw the end. Oh, you saw the ends here? Okay, we're gonna put a gel here, and they took over. And then when I start asking to be a more aggressive by holding the rent, I send them a letter, I'm not gonna pay the rent anymore, I'm gonna stop here. He says, oh my friend, you're gonna get in big trouble, we are a big corporation, we have several buildings here, we're gonna take you to court, and we took a attorney, a super attorney, and you're gonna be barred from renting a house anywhere in the US. Mm -hmm. Fine, let's do this. So I call <laughs> Actually, sir, can I stop you right there? This, this sounds like, like a huge problem, and I actually, you know, uh, wrote infestations in the existence of other sort of conditions of disrepair or unsanitary conditions in apartments is a, a real problem that needs to be addressed that we see a, a, a lot. I'm hearing a lot of specific detail from you. I'm happy to talk to you about that in particular after the fact. I'll say generally <laughs> that you're doing the right stuff. You are reaching out to the city. The city has an obligation to help enforce these issues. You are taking into account the fact that uh, your obligation to pay rent it sort of has, has this, this caveat that, well, the landlord has this, this obligation to you to keep your apartment in a habitable condition, and he's not doing that, and so let's, let's, you know, <laughs> let's, let's try to work it out that way. I think, I think you're doing the right things. I'm happy to talk to you about it further, um, and it, it is a real problem. I know, and, and they don't want to get into settlement. They want to take me as an ex example for any other lawsuit that comes to you. Oh, we already deal with this problem. This is not going to be done. So I'm basically done. My trial is coming up this week, and I don't know what to do. I, I can't. I, 
talk to talk to Adam. That's the answer, I think. And, 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 and the other half of the answer is is, you know, talk to other tenants in your building, get organized. There's power in numbers, as as you've been hearing from Lisa. Go Absolutely. to City Life. Absolutely. Uh, anybody else have a question? Yes. Sure. Um, thank you all so much. I, I want to direct this question um, at Adam and, and Lisa. Um, I, a lot of the what we're hearing on the panel is, a, I think, an appropriate indictment of like the big glass boxes that are coming up to the luxury houses in otherwise low-income neighborhoods, driving up the, the rent. Um, and I, you hear that a lot. And now I'm starting to hear or uh, read like this counter argument coming out from academics of like, no, that's actually the, the solution. That like um, the, the, the issue in places like Brooklyn or East Boston, uh, East yes. Boston is that uh, there's just not enough housing and that the rich people are going into the places where otherwise low income or middle income people would be going. Um, and it, and it, doesn't, it, it doesn't seem like what you guys are saying on the ground is actually, uh, what they're saying is born out on the ground. How do you respond to that counter argument? I want to hear Lisa's answer. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we we hear the supply side argument a lot from developers, right? Um, and and anyone who has lived in the city for the past twenty years or or has worked in the city, particularly housing advocates, know that 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 is just it, it's literally not borne out by experience. It is that I, you know our our simple response is well, show me when that has happened in Boston. Show me when it has happened that, that, that luxury development has actually lowered prices in and around the neighborhoods. We'd like to know. It has never happened. What, what we know to be true is that there, there is a need for more affordable housing, truly affordable housing, and there's a need for for active protection for people who currently live in the neighborhoods. So, so we, we know that, um, that there are unintended consequences to things like transit-oriented development, you know, where, where, where this new construction or, or, um, or um, a new transit, you know, more infrastructure will, will, will actually um, put pressure on the rents, right? And so we think that really, the, Really, we, we just need to debunk the supply side argument and, and just pivot the conversation to what is your plan for stopping displacement in the neighborhoods now? What is your plan for increasing affordable housing in the neighborhoods now? Right. I, I, I agree with every, every bit of that. I think, I think sort of the, the counter counterpoint that you get a lot is, well, I can't point at the example because like this, the sample size is too small. You know, when one tower goes up, of course that's not going to solve the problem. You have to look at the you have to look at the, the super long view. And then I don't I don't know who said this, but like in the long view, we're all dead. And so like and gone. Right, right, right. So so that's it. It can't just be that view. What what I do sort of as my response is, you know, sure. In terms of just abstract, you're building in a vacuum. If do, you know when you increase supply, does does the price go down? That, that may be true in the abstract, but let's talk about the family who has lived on this block for 25 years and who you know, goes to church around the street and whose cousin lives next door. And like, these folks are actually going to be displaced. And that is a, a real, real, real need that needs to be addressed and, and for me outweighs any sort of abstract hypothetical argument that you, that you might counter with. You didn't ask me, but I'm going to answer that too, because I, I, I can't help myself. I, I just, you know, when people say, well, there are a lot of people who need to get to work, right? And a lot of people in the T. And, and someone says, well, 42 Ferraris were built this year. You're thinking, those 42 Ferraris are not helping anyone get to work in Boston. They're completely different markets. They're not helping people, right? And so the fact that someone built some cars that nobody can, can, can afford to buy has no relevance in my mind. But anyway, <laughs> just my opinion. All right. Um, OK, someone else? Any, one last question. Alan. What can we do to increase the number of lawyers who are finding funding for lawyers? Alan, you seem like a plant now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know well, either. <laughs> well, one answer is that uh, one of, uh, in addition to having this lecture, uh, another way that we're all remembering Dave's memory 
is with the David Abraham Grossman Fund, mm -hmm. which is a, a not a not <laughs> fund. Okay. Gonna come up oh, Stacey's going to talk about this. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to, I didn't no, mean to, great. to step on Stacey's comments, but yeah. that's going to be one answer. This is, this is going to be a fund that is going to fund uh, fellowships for lawyers to, to go and do this work. Yeah, that's great. That's a great so before Stacey ask. comes up here, I just want to take one minute to um, recognize the sponsors of this event, Dean Minow and her office, the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau, and Project No One Leaves, uh, especially its co-chairs, Stanford Fraser and Sophie Elsner. Please stand up. people that make me love my job every day. They are so wonderful in their leadership throughout this past year and throughout their time here at, at, at Harvard. Um, and I finally want to thank the organizers of this event, especially um, Leanne Siegel and Sophie Elsner. Leanne, where are you? I don't know where she came from, but she's amazing. She doesn't go to Harvard Law School, but she's like this gift from God. So thank you so much. Um, and finally, what I'd like to ask um, Stacy Grossman, Dave's wife, to come up here. Stacy and her two children have been tireless in their effort to continue Dave's work and honor his incredible legacy. And we um, like to have Stacy wrap it up. You're, I don't know. This is blocked. St stand in front. Stand in front. Oh, good, perfect. <laughs> Can I Thank stand you. Close to you. Yes. Okay. Um, Lev, Shana, and I are deeply appreciative to Dean Minow, the members of Project No One Leaves, Esme Caramello, and to the students, faculty, and staff of the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau for organizing this memorial lecture and panel discussion that speaks so emphatically to the issues our beloved David was so passionate about. Tonight's discourse extends David's narrative and amplifies his professional legacy's plea for equity and fair practices in the housing market. Thank you. We are also especially grateful to tonight's keynote speaker, Professor Matt Desmond, for sharing his important research about evictions and displacement. Matt, your work and your voice have ignited a national dialogue about this decade-long, eviscerating housing crisis. I know David will be celebrating your efforts and be thankful for the level of engagement about displacement your book has generated. It is my greatest hope that this engagement will intensify and bring about humane and equitable solutions to our nation's eviction epidemic. I would also like to extend my sincerest gratitude to Eloise Lawrence, Adam Myers, Lisa Owen, Owens Pinto, and Carrie Chance for lending their expert voices to this conversation. I am in awe and deeply humbled by your tenacity and moral endurance. Your legal and social activist efforts have provided empowerment and hope to many. You are staving off evictions and preserving neighborhoods and communities. Thank you. And thank you to Ethan Mascoop for lending his powerful visual imagery to this discourse. I hope you enjoy it. Many of you are here tonight because you knew my husband and or because you too have a sincere concern about individuals and families being evicted from their homes. I want to thank you for your attendance and participation in this most memorable evening and would encourage you to continue this conversation in your homes, at work, in the classroom, and at the community places that you frequent. Buy and read Matt Desmond's book mm -hmm. yeah. and encourage others to do the same. Mm -hmm. 
visit the website that Matt and his wife Tessa created called Just Shelter, which shares eviction stories and also identifies state and national organizations that support housing initiatives. On a local level, consider canvassing with Project No One Leaves. Mm -hmm. Volunteer with City Life Vida Urbana. Petitions or write to Boston City Council representatives urging them to support just cause eviction legislation. <laughs> and please consider making a donation to an organization or organizations like City Life Vita Urbana, Coalition for Occupied Homes in Foreclosure, Mass Law Reform Institute, Greater Boston Legal Services the Evicted Book Foundation, Legal Services Center, the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau, and or my personal favorite, the David Abraham Grossman Fund for Social Justice. <laughs> These organizations and many more are cumulatively fighting to change housing laws, keep people in their homes, and are dedicated to realizing a future where safe, healthy, affordable housing is abundant in neighborhoods where there is an urgent need. Let's continue to expand the circle of knowledge around this very important issue. Let's invite all those that we can to join us in this struggle. And let's fix this very broken aspect of our humanity. Because when we donate, when we raise awareness, when we volunteer, and when we canvass. But most importantly, when we fight, we win. Thank you.